During the summer of 2019, the Mobile Bay National Estuary Program was asked by its Government Networks Committee, made up of elected officials representing coastal Alabama, to present a scientifically objective assessment of issues related to the closure of the coal ash pond at Alabama Power's Plant Berry. The purpose? To ensure the public has a well-rounded understanding of the trade-offs between capping the pond in place and transporting the ash to a lined facility. This film presents our findings. On December 22, 2008, in Kingston, Tennessee, an earthen dam around the pond containing more than a billion gallons of wet coal ash suddenly breached. A slow-moving tsunami of coal ash slurry flooded 300 acres and 26 homes before sliding into the Emory River and Watts Bar Lake. It was one of the largest industrial spills in American history. The Mobile Tensaw Delta is home to another coal ash pond, located at Alabama Power's Plant Berry in Bucks, Alabama. Built in 1965, it covers a landscape of almost 600 acres and holds more than 22 million cubic yards of wet coal ash. Could what happened in Kingston happen here? The story of coal ash is a story of the times. It's a story about the protection of our outdoor way of life, our families, and our food. It's a story about economic development. At the turn of the 20th century, the infrastructure throughout the South lagged behind other areas of the country, and its people and economy suffered for it. Poverty was endemic. During the height of the Great Depression, massive investment in public works led to the creation of federal programs to electrify the South. By the 1950s, with ready access to the coal mines in Appalachia, coal-fired steam plants were built next to rivers, so the coal could easily and cheaply arrive by barge. Plants were built, coal was burned, and the waste remaining was coal ash. Back then, we didn't know much about coal ash, but we did know breathing the dust wasn't good. <coughs> so, to keep the ash from blowing around, it was mixed with water into a slurry and poured in nearby impoundments called ponds. For the next several decades, these coal-fired steam plants were built, generating electricity for millions of people and creating billions of tons of coal ash deposited in ponds and landfills. For a while, coal ash was a case of out of sight, out of mind. Then came Kingston. Almost immediately after the spill, money began pouring into academic research, investigating the harmful impacts of coal ash to groundwater. As it turns out, coal ash contains naturally occurring heavy metals, which, in high concentrations, can make people very sick. These metals are freed when mixed with water. The process is simple. Just like a tea bag, as ash steeps, the heavy metals dissolve. If enough of this toxic tea seeps into the surrounding groundwater, it can harm humans, fish, and wildlife. In 2009, the Obama administration began writing regulations to protect the environment from coal ash contaminants. After six long years, the Coal Combustion Residuals, or CCR rule, was enacted. Under this new rule, if a pond is located in wetlands, near a fault line, or within five feet of groundwater, or the groundwater monitoring data around the pond reveals exceedances of the CCR limits, it would have to close. The law requires utilities to conduct this regular monitoring and to make this data public. The Environmental Integrity Project, a citizens group, reviewed this publicly available data from 273 ponds and found 92% of them were in violation of the CCR rule. 
Because no two coal ash ponds are the same, each with its own size, geology, and infrastructure connecting it to the outside world, EPA regulators knew there was no perfect solution. So the CCR rule provides two options for closure. Either the ponds can be closed in place, drying out the ash and encapsulating it with a cover to keep water out, or the ponds can be closed by moving the ash to a Martin Line landfill. Any new ash produced by a utility must be disposed of either in one of these line facilities or recycled. In 2018, the Alabama Department of Environmental Management created a state CCR program to establish oversight authority for facilities generating coal ash. Under this program, the Alabama utilities must submit closure-related plans to ADEM for approval, a step not required under the federal rule. Close in place and close by removal both come with environmental and community trade-offs. So what's at stake? The Mobile Tensaw Delta is the nation's second largest intact river delta system and Alabama's largest wetland landscape, encompassing over 260,000 acres. With the highest species diversity of any state east of the Mississippi River, Alabama leads the country in the number of freshwater aquatic species. It's no wonder the Mobile Tensaw Delta has become known as America's Amazon. The Plantberry Coal Ash Pond, built by Alabama Power in 1965, sits adjacent to the Mobile River within its habitat-rich delta. It is one of the largest in the country. At 597 acres, you could fit downtown Mobile within it. The river system surrounding Plantberry is fed by water, stored and conveyed underground, in porous and permeable geologic formations called aquifers. Aquifers yield significant quantities of water for industrial and agriculture uses, and certain aquifers are a source of public water supplies. In Mobile and Baldwin counties, there are three geologic aquifers exposed at the land surface. The most recent is the alluvial, which flows directly into our area's major rivers. It's made up of sediments deposited along the river course. The next is the citronelle, relatively shallow and is used for some agricultural purposes. The oldest and largest is the Miocene, which underlies all of coastal Alabama and is the primary source of drinking water for all of Baldwin County and parts of Mobile County. In 2015, Alabama Power installed 16 monitoring wells around the Plantberry Pond to regularly measure groundwater movement and quality. This enormous coal ash pond sits atop layers of clay, silty clay, and sandy clay which largely restricts the flow of water from the pond to the alluvial aquifer. Still, monitoring revealed the pond at Plantberry is leaching a number of heavy metals, with arsenic and cobalt exceeding the maximum levels allowed under the CCR rule. Both of these heavy metals are naturally distributed in our air, waters, and soils. The rule uses the EPA drinking water standard as a threshold for arsenic, because if ingested, arsenic can cause gastrointestinal and neurological symptoms, higher rates of cardiovascular disease, or even cancer after prolonged exposure. The threshold for cobalt is based on naturally occurring levels in the surrounding area. Although cobalt is used for the temporary treatment of anemia, effects of exposure over the long term are largely unknown. There is evidence ingestion or inhalation of cobalt in extreme concentrations can cause fertility issues and cancer. It is important to note, the monitored exceedances for arsenic and cobalt at Plantberry occurred within the alluvial aquifer, which carries the contaminants to the river and not into any drinking water sources, and resulting riverine concentrations are low enough to present little, if any, threat to human health by any established pathway. At these diluted concentrations, there's just not enough research to determine any adverse effects to fish and wildlife. With the state program in place, 
A&M penalized Alabama Power for these arsenic and cobalt exceedances. In response, Alabama Power agreed to pay a fine and address the contaminant concentrations by removing the water from the ash and closing the pond. As part of the order, Alabama Power will provide monitoring reports to ADEM so the agency can track the company's progress in mitigating the contamination. According to Alabama Power, it has opted to close in place in part to address the groundwater contamination cited in ADEM's order in the most timely manner. Their plan includes dewatering a portion of the coal ash by draining it and treating the water at an on-site wastewater treatment facility, excavating some of the coal ash and moving it 100 yards further away from the Mobile River on its eastern side and 750 yards further back from the southern turn in the river, reducing its footprint by 45%, creating a redundant inner dike system surrounding the smaller footprint for additional containment and flood protection, building a low cutoff wall extending from the interior dike into the underlying clay layer to intercept horizontal contaminant migration. Designing an internal drainage system within the ash footprint around the perimeter of the dike to accelerate the removal of water in the ash. And placing an impermeable cap over the ash with an integrated stormwater drainage system designed to channel water into an adjacent stormwater pond. To comply with state of Alabama rules governing the management of solid waste, including CCR, Alabama Power will monitor groundwater for at least 30 years from the date it officially closed the pond. As the state agency with ultimate responsibility for overseeing Alabama Power's compliance, ADEM will evaluate if monitoring needs to be continued beyond the 30-year period. Although no comprehensive assessment of closure by removal has been conducted, the following factors will help inform a more well-rounded understanding of the trade-offs between close in place and close by removal. How much time will each option take? The number of trucks necessary to move the 22.7 million tons of coal ash at Plant Berry, if placed bumper to bumper, would stretch from Mobile to Japan. Because of limited road infrastructure around the site, the move will require over a million dump trucks each carrying 20 cubic yards of ash, one leaving every four minutes, 10 hours a day, six days a week for 24 years, spanning a generation of Alabamians. According to Alabama Power, the time it would take to complete dewatering, consolidating and capping the ash in place would be 12 and a half years. What are the climate implications of each option? Our planet's climate is affected by the amount of greenhouse gases emitted into the atmosphere. These gases act as a blanket, trapping the sun's warmth near the Earth's surface. Dump trucks and heavy equipment are major sources of these greenhouse gases. Both closing in place and closing by removal will require earthwork at the pond to prepare the ash for transport. Close in place will require equipment and trucks to deliver field dirt and consolidate the ash. Close by removal will require over a million trucks to move the ash to another line facility, generating significantly more greenhouse gases over the period of transport. How will each option impact water quality? Plant Berry's coal ash pond sits within five feet of groundwater, was built in wetlands, and shows evidence of some leaching of heavy metals into the groundwater. According to Alabama Power, monitoring at Plant Berry indicates significant upward pressure from the alluvial aquifer below. But the weight of the water in the pond exerts an even greater downward pressure, putting some contaminants into the alluvial aquifer, where they flow toward the river approximately three feet per year. Once these contaminants enter the Mobile River, the quantity and speed of the river carry them downstream, where they are diluted and almost impossible to detect. By removing the water and compacting the dry ash, toxic constituents will remain bound to this coal residue. In this state, the contaminants have a greatly reduced capacity to migrate out of the site. If the internal drainage system can minimize the amount of water at the bottom of the consolidated ash, a review from an independent engineer suggests 
little to no additional groundwater contamination in the aquifer. If this balance cannot be maintained and reductions in groundwater contamination are not met, ADEM would require Alabama Power to find other options of remediation. If the ash were removed, the heavy metals in the ash would largely be removed with it. However, any existing contamination in the underlying clays and aquifer would continue to move over time to the river. During relocation, over a million additional dump trucks on the roads would cause a different type of water pollution, including oil, grease, dirt, fuel, rubber, and fugitive ash being deposited on roadways and carried by stormwater runoff to local waters. Any ash transferred to line landfills can still potentially impact groundwater over time. According to the Conservation Law Foundation, no line landfills are 100% effective, and leachate from landfills moving into underlying aquifers has been documented. Who will ultimately be responsible for the coal ash post-closure? According to ADEM, whatever entity is in possession of the ash is responsible for it, including any contractors hired to move it. If the ash is closed in place, Alabama Power will be solely responsible. What risks do each option pose for catastrophic release of coal ash into the environment? No one wants what happened in Kingston to happen in the Mobile Tensaw Delta, a catastrophic failure leading to a massive spill into the surrounding environment. According to a Tennessee Valley Authority report, the spill resulted from poorly maintained storage facilities, inadequate training, accountability and communication, and failure to follow engineering best practices. Over the many decades of coal storage in Alabama, no such dam failures have ever been documented. If the ash were moved to a line site, the risk of catastrophic failure decreases over time. Once removal is complete, the risk is zero. Any remaining contaminant risk is transferred to the destination landfill. For close in place, the likelihood of catastrophic failure also decreases over the time during closure. Should a catastrophic flood combined with one meter of sea level rise occur, modeling indicates the cap cresting at an elevation of 70 feet will not be completely overtopped. According to Alabama Power's plan, containment and flood protection measures will include drying and compacting the ash before it is capped, redundant dikes to further safeguard the ash, and a drainage system to channel any water infiltrating the ash to an on-site wastewater treatment plant. These measures combined will prevent any major release of material from flowing into the Mobile River. What are the risks of each option to human health? Moving the ash poses an elevated risk to worker and community health. These risks include a large workforce exposed to the ash during loading, transporting, and unloading for over 20 years. The added traffic to and from the landfill is another concern. According to Alabama Department of Transportation Statistics, moving the ash only 16 miles over 24 years could result in more than 100 traffic accidents. For closing in place, fewer workers will have exposure over 12 and a half years since less than half of the material will be moved only short distances within the site. Since all material is kept on site, the external community impacts will be minimized. And then there are the issues of money and environmental justice. Data from around the country indicate closed by removal is significantly more expensive than closed in place. Each state's utility regulators determine if this extra cost will be passed on to the consumers. Regarding environmental justice, line landfills in the state of Alabama are disproportionately located near poor and minority communities where social justice, economic opportunity, and environmental protection are fragile. Beyond any air and water quality impacts, the scarcity of resources available to these communities will challenge their ability to handle the impacts of ash transport on their infrastructure, community, health, and economic growth potential. Looking forward, 
Technologies are being developed to reduce the harmful impacts of coal ash and recycle this waste into a raw material for new products. From microbes that sequester contaminants to super strong and flexible concrete for building in hurricane prone areas, scientists and industry are finding new ways to beneficially reuse this waste. We have all benefited from the convenience and affordability of electricity produced by coal. For decades, we've turned on the lights and opened the refrigerator without thinking about the waste generated. As consumers of electricity, the fate of this coal ash is our shared responsibility. The best way we can act on this shared responsibility is by making sure the incredible biological and cultural diversity of the Delta is protected and well managed for future generations. With a focus on the future, is a public-private partnership possible? A program which includes research on the many stressors potentially impacting its world-renowned biodiversity, a coalition of leaders focused on holistically managing the entire Mobile Bay watershed, a community of wise stewards ensuring the integrity of the Delta's waters for fish. The Mobile Bay National Estuary Program is engaged in a community effort to develop a comprehensive plan for the Mobile Tensaw Delta. Plant Berry's coal ash pond is one of many factors affecting the long-term health, value, and use of this special place. The plan will provide recommendations on how we, as champions of the Delta, can improve and protect this natural treasure together. If the Mobile Tensaw Delta matters to you, if the seafood nurtured in its wetlands matters, if better management of our environment matters, get educated. Learn about Alabama Power's plan for closing the plant berry coal ash pond. Get going. Go to mobilebaynep.com slash delta to learn about the watershed and participate in planning for its future. Let your voice be heard. Encourage support for the state agencies charged with protecting the rich habitats and wildlife of our Delta. Join us in being a positive voice for the wise stewardship of the Alabama coast and its incomparable way of life.